He felt he himself was being inauthentic. He was living a lie. He had been living a lie for a long time. And he caught himself realizing that he knew it all along. But now how does he get out of there? Well, that's the problem. He doesn't. All right, welcome everybody to this new video. Today I'm going to continue my Hermann Hesse series and today I want to introduce the historical background of the novel, the era, the problems for the individual, all the confusion, the crises and how it influenced Hermann Hesse's writing process and the content of the novel. So Hesse started to write the novel in the early 1920s. The First World War had just been lost by Germany in 1918 and it was a time of great confusion and say humiliation for the whole German people. Hesse himself was against the war and he was very vocal about it and that's why many of his readers abandoned him. So they wanted to have nothing to do with him because how dare you criticize the German government and the German war effort because many people actually saw Germany as the victim of foreign aggression. Hesse didn't share this view and he just didn't hold back. He didn't care if people didn't like his view. So he just wrote open letters, he wrote articles in newspapers and many, many other things to let people understand that this war was an unjust war. Hesse was a pacifist. He just couldn't stand violence of any kind. So this scared away many of his readers. And in 1919, shortly after the war, Hermann Hesse published a novel which was called Damian and it was a bestseller. Now Damian was published under a pseudonym. So Hesse did not put Hermann Hesse on the cover but Emile Sinclair. But of course, people realized pretty early that was a Hesse novel. Now, I might talk about the novel Damian in a separate video. Only so much for now. There's a direct connection between Damian and the Steppenwolf. Basically, Damian is kind of like a warm-up for the Steppenwolf. So the only thing I want to say now is the motto of the novel Damian, and it is, Das Leben jedes Menschen ist ein Weg zu sich selber hin. Der Versuch eines Weges, die Andeutung eines Pfades. So every human being's life is a way to himself. It's the attempt of a way. It's the hint of a path. And this plays into the whole step involved, this kind of like feeling of disorientation. What is my path? So Hesse was already on this trajectory in 1919 when the novel was published and he kind of continued this crisis, the sense of confusion, the attempt to find his way in the Steppenwolf, where it basically becomes the main theme. Anyway, after the war, the German Empire was annihilated. So the Kaiser fled to the Netherlands and there was kind of like a power vacuum. What can we do now? And that's when the Weimar Republic was founded. It was kind of an experiment with democracy. Germans did not really have any idea what democracy should look like, so there were different factions. Some of them said, well, let's try like a Soviet-style republic, and others said, let's just go back to the Kaiser, but the problem is the Kaiser's not coming back, so what can we do? So this whole period kind of like a transition period, and it ended very tragically in National Socialism. So the whole time of the 1920s was a time of crises, and there was inflation, Politics were just a total mess and the economy did horribly in the beginning until the second half of the 1920s where things kind of like started to prosper for a while and then also descended into total chaos. So the whole era of the 1920s was a time of a loss of orientation. People did not know what to do. People did not know where their path would or should lead them to. So what's the right direction? What am I supposed to do now? So can anyone tell me what the best way to live my life would be. So maybe, and this is also what Hesse was contemplating is, probably should not look for outside solutions, but look inward. So it's a time of introspection. And this is also a chance, an opportunity to probably find something essential within ourselves because looking at the environment, there's nothing it has to offer except misery and more chaos. So basically, many people had the same feeling. That's why it was also like an era of oblivion. People tried to forget actively and passively because the time was just awful. And many people tried to just not face reality and they kind of retreated into alternative worlds, like the world of, let's say, alternative religions, the world of hedonism. 
the world of drugs and just to make them forget how terrible contemporary reality actually was. So the whole era was marked by existential angst, uncertainty, and it can be seen in the art that was prospering at that time. So people had this new hunger for life because the consequences of the war were especially tough on Germany and the Germans. They had to pay reparations to basically the whole world. So people had this kind of hunger for life and like real hunger for food actually because in the time of inflation people could not afford to buy anything. The problem is the more people started to forget the war and its aftershocks, the more they were reminded of it every day because they could see what the war did to people every day on the streets. That time, many war veterans came back as cripples. So they were missing limbs. They were missing an eye. They were probably even missing a jaw or something like that. So people were constantly reminded of the terror, the horror of war. Wherever they looked, they saw it. It was all around them. And of course, they tried not to see it. So it was a time of extremes. And people were also like oscillating between total desperation, and on the other hand, the sense of having to embrace life and live life to the fullest. And now the famous German painter Otto Dix depicted the world of the veterans in his paintings. So he shows the counterpart of the glamorous world of the nightclubs, the jazz clubs, the beautiful people in there, the great music, the amusement in his veterans that are populating the streets. So this painting shows the horrors of the gas war. People wearing gas masks, soldiers, and they're throwing hand grenades. And it's um, very graphic. I mean, those gas masks themselves already make them look like skulls. And there's dead bodies. This one in horrible pose. You can see the terror on the face of the soldier. And then there's a street scene. So we see these veterans and uh, one is missing his legs. And he's using like a board with wheels on it to be able to move. The other one is also missing an arm and a leg. On this one, this guy is basically missing all his limbs. You can see he's sitting there and it looks like people are just running away from him, except for the dog and he's basically pissing on him. So it shows the disrespect that people had for these veterans. He also seems to be blind. Then this is a parade of German soldiers and they're all crippled. It's, an, it's a satirical approach to that whole enthusiasm many Germans had when the war started. They were heading for Paris. We'll make it there in a few days and then we'll beat the French. And the war actually lasted four years and brought horrible, horrible misery for everyone involved in it. And so this is the counterpart of it. It's like colorful and there's people dancing, enjoying life. There's music. So this is the hedonistic aspect of the 1920s when people were just hungry for life and just tried to forget about this horrible world outside where they could see all these wounded veterans every day, day after day. So from the beginning, Hesse was against the war. Problem is, after the First World War, when he published Damien, he fell into a deep crisis and suffered from severe writer's block. He just couldn't focus, he couldn't write, he had no inspiration. Then he started to get really depressed, his marriage failed, and he looked for help and he found Carl Gustav Jung, the famous Swiss psychologist. And Jung advised him to see writing as a form of therapy. And this is when Hesse started to work on the Steppenwolf. And he actually read parts of it in the therapy sessions he attended. And right about that time, he also entered midlife crisis, which did not help his mental health at all. He became more depressed, and you can see this basically on every page of the Steppenwolf. Now, Hess's own definition of the Steppenwolf is very interesting. He says, I cannot and naturally would not wish to prescribe to my readers how they are to understand my novel. Let each one make of it what is appropriate and helpful to him. Nevertheless, it would please me very much if many of them were to realize that the story of the Steppenwolf, though it describes an illness and a crisis, does not describe one that leads to death or decline, but rather the opposite, to recovery. So that's very interesting. He did not view his novel as a tragedy. It's the opposite. He actually saw it as a description of a way out of depression and misery, a kind of manual for healing. And I've mentioned before what kind of 
person Harry Haller, the protagonist of the novel, is. He is about 50 years old, just like Hesse when he published the book. Harry Haller. Harry is a short form of Hermann, and Harry Haller's initials are the same as Hermann Hesse, H H. And so Harry Haller is an artist, he's an author, and he is contemplating to end his life. Hesse points out a little bit about Harry Haller's background, how he grew up. And there are very interesting parallels between Halle and Hesse. Halle and Hesse, they both report how they grew up in a very religious and strict household. Both Hesse and Halle have a limp. Now, Hesse and Halle also complain that the hierarchy in school made the life of students miserable and just gave them this very, very strict structure that left no space for creativity. And when Hesse wrote The Steppenwolf, he was suffering from severe depression. And both Halle and Hesse, they feel that life is basically misery and tragedy. And the only way out might be just to end it all. And both of them also suffer from writer's block. So they used to be inspired and they used to love to write, but now they just can't write a single line anymore. And they have to find a way out of this crisis. Now, Hesse liked literature, cigarettes, and alcohol very much. That's just like Harry Haller. And uh, Haller, of course, his appearance is very similar to Hesse. He liked medium height, short hair, and um, just wearing more casual clothes, not really paying much attention to clothes and uh, to their appearance in general. And Harry Haller reports how the whole world is basically inauthentic. It's more about your reputation. It's more about your appearance than about substantial things, essential things. So Hesse writes, Das eine Mal hatte ich meinen bürgerlichen Ruf samt meinem Vermögen verloren und hatte lernen müssen, auf die Achtung derer zu verzichten, die bisher vor mir den Hut gezogen hatten. Das andere Mal war über Nacht mein Familienleben zusammengebrochen, meine geisteskrank gewordene Frau hatte mich aus Haus und Behagen vertrieben, Liebe und Vertrauen hatte sich plötzlich in Hass und tödlichen Kampf verwandelt, mitleidig und verächtlich blickten die Nachbarn mir nach, damals hatte meine Vereinsamung ihren Anfang genommen, so his whole world fell apart, his wife became mentally ill, and she made him leave his home. And so he lost his money, he lost the facade he had built over many years, and people who used to respect him were only feeling contempt for him, and they let him notice it. So that's when he realized this world is just completely phony. So it's all about representing something, but it's all about appearance. It's not about character. It's all about... Materialism. Ein Friedhof war unsere Kulturwelt. Hier waren Jesus Christus und Sokrates. Hier waren Mozart und Haydn. Waren Dante und Goethe bloß noch erblindete Namen auf rostenen Blechtafeln. Our cultural world is a cemetery. Here there are Jesus Christ, Socrates, Mozart, Haydn, Dante, Goethe. They're just names, blind names on rusty metal plates. So Harry Haller only sees one way out. He has to contemplate leaving this world by ending his life. And it becomes kind of like a fetish. And he gets really obsessed with this idea to have found the only way out. Immer deutlicher tat dies Bild sich vor mir auf und immer deutlicher mit Rasenklopfen im Herzen fühlte ich die Angst aller Ängste, die Todesfurcht. Ja, ich hatte eine grauenhafte Furcht vor dem Tode. Interestingly enough, he is afraid of death. But on the other hand, he's also fascinated by it. There's this typically German concept of Todessehnsucht. It's a desire, a longing for death. It's a rather romanticist concept. And you can see this in Harry Haller and actually in other novels by Hesse too. So it becomes this sort of, this idea of embracing death, basically of running into the abyss. So in a way, Harry Haller tries to find the opposite of the bourgeois lifestyle. And the only way he can do this is by becoming a wolf, or just by embracing his dark side, his second nature, the nature of the Steppenwolf. Wer die Höhlen abstreift, die Ideale des Bürgertums aufgibt, sich hingibt, sein Leiden, seine Einsamkeit hinnimmt, die Vielheit des Ichs akzeptiert und den Humor entdeckt, wird zum Unsterblichen. If you embrace loneliness, if you accept the diversity of your ego, and if you discover humor, then you will find immortality. So he has to become an authentic human being by discovering the world of his soul in all his aspects. Hesse makes this connection between, between the Steppenwolf and other famous wolves. One of them is called Johann Wolfgang Goethe. 
and the other one is Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. So Wolfgang contains Wolf, Wolf, and these are the idols of Harihara. Uh, he worships good and he worships Mozart. And Harihara only sees one way. He has to become one of these famous wolves in order to defeat the bourgeois side of him and to not become or not remain and stay a part of this inauthentic world forever. So Hesse really disliked the bürger, the bourgeois. Again, he himself was also one of them. The profession of being a writer was called a bürgerlicher Schriftsteller. That's like the bourgeois author. And Hesse was more or less the prototype of that. Let's say on quite a similar level, like Thomas Mann. Because a bürgerlicher Autor, a bourgeois author, makes a living writing books, publishing books, selling books. So this is where his money comes from. But Hesse hated himself for that. And that he, as a true artist, had to participate in that money game. So he had the impression he wasn't only selling books, but he was basically selling his soul to an audience that he disliked because he did not want to be a part of their world, although he was. So it's kind of like the self-loathing that he was feeling all the time that also played into his depression because he felt he himself was being inauthentic. He was living a lie. He had been living a lie for a long time. And he caught himself realizing that he knew it all along. But now how does he get out of there? Well, that's the problem. He doesn't. Der Bürger ist deshalb seinem Wesen nach ein Geschöpf von schwachem Lebensantrieb ängstlich. Jede Preisgabe seiner selbst fürchtend, leicht zu regieren. Er hat darum anstelle der Macht die Majorität gesetzt, anstelle der Gewalt das Gesetz, anstelle der Verantwortung das Abstimmungsverfahren. So he says, the bourgeois, in his essence, is a creature with a very weak vitality, scared, afraid of, giving away too much about himself, easy to govern. And this is why the bourgeois exchanged power with the majority, exchanged force and power with the law, and also exchanged responsibility with voting, elections, and the like. And here, Heidegger's concept of the man comes into play too. It's this inauthentic man of contemporary society that basically is the true characteristic of this society. It is a society that not even in its conversations can be authentic. It's only talk, talk, talk. Words, words, words. But no one is really saying anything. So... It's all platitudes. It's all facade. Nothing is real. Nothing means anything anymore. Everyone is living a lie. Everyone is participating in that lie. And people might even realize that. But still they keep on playing this game, keep on feeding this lie and making it bigger and bigger, inflating it until it becomes so big that there's no way out anymore. They have to continue living this lie forever. And this is not what Hesse wants. He is thinking about a way out of it. He cannot find the answer to this exit in the outside world. It can only be found through a process of introspection and finding oneself by descending into the abyss of one's soul. And what you find there on the bottom of the abyss might frighten you. It might even scare you to death. It might be very unpleasant. But if you want to live a life of authenticity, you have to go down into the abyss of your soul. There's no way around it. So this is why in Steppenwolf, Hesse makes his protagonist, Harry Haller, descend into the abyss of the magical theater in the end. And what he finds there will change his life forever. All right, so next time I'm going to talk about Helmina and Maria the two most important female characters of the novel. And I will also introduce Pablo, a jazz musician, who becomes a sort of friend of Harry. So thank you very much for watching. See you next time.